This shall be my second and last talk, hopefully. But of course, please come up to me and ask any question because uh, we really travel a long way and I, I miss my kids and uh, there's no other reason except for coming here to make connection with some of you very good soldiers and warriors on this topic. This talk will be about Arctic sea ice and uh, climate change and uh, in a sense, of course, you already can see hint. Natural clearly for me means uh, something like the solar, but, but one must not forget, natural can also include something called the internal variability of the climate system that has nothing to do with CO2 or whatsoever, right? It's about the ocean, that sort of stuff. <clears throat> the first question is to pose. If this CO2 is such a great powerful force for changing the world, weather and climate, let's ask the question, how is it, how's it going, guys, <clears throat> in the last two to three decades? Let's put up a mountain plot. This is a plot done by Lord Mountain, showing you, uh, I think this is RSS, the satellite data from the microwave sounding units. By the way, for those of you who may not be aware, this sounding unit's measurement is actually measuring the vibration of the oxygen, molecular oxygen, which is very uniform. So measuring this temperature really means near global measurements. And it shows from, uh, well, 1980 until present time, there is part of warming trend, clearly. And then the thing that I want you to focus on is, of course, that famous period. It is not cherry-picking in this sense, because at any given time, if this CO2 were to be, you know, what they have said, over this time period from 97, 98 until now, the war has actually contributed almost one-third of all its total influence since Industrial Revolution, 1750 or so. And this is very huge, actually. And if this CO2 were to be what they say, then I have to say that we have to expect some warming. And the fact that we don't see it provide a very significant challenge to the hypothesis or the idea. Actually, it's not a hypothesis because they have never formulated this as a form of hypothesis, which is part of the hint on why this issue is not about scientific issues. Then come along serious, uh, I would say, science abuser, I would use that word, <coughs> in English. Uh, hopefully, it can be translated properly in German. <coughs> abuser is being somebody that is really bad. When the temperature is not warming according to the way they wish it to be, then you have a group of scientists from the US uh, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, started to show you graph like this. The bottom line is that essentially they make a suggestion that the sea surface temperature is warming up, is that it needed some corrections, and you can read that so on and so forth, but you basically will be going in a circle in some sense. And they are telling you that the trend now is strictly warming and there is no pause at all. That's the whole idea because this situation is called a pause, which is not a very good word actually because it's not stopping or anything. It's just doing what is in terms of the climate system. It's an evolution. And then that was a global temperature data including the sea surface temperature. Now we look at just strictly the meteorological station as I tried to point out. This also appears to be showing that there is uh, quite a strong warming even near the end of it. And this again can tell you how much room is involved in terms of production of this so-called quote-unquote global uh, surface temperature record. And I often warn them, I mean, if you demand anything to, be, to have a systematic, I guess, internal consistency, the first, check I want, the first check that I want to do in terms of whether it's flat or is it warming up is to try to see how best we can measure this system. This is the best measurement we get, which is the NASA series satellite measurement, which is trying to measure the flow of energy, both in infrared and, and visible wavelengths. And what they produce here is basically a trend plot from March 2000 to December 2011 or so. There ought to be some update, of course, but uh, as you know, it's a government agency, so the product they produce is uh, a bit slower than usual. But I, I would venture to suggest that it's not much of a difference if we can extend it to December 2015. So let's ask ourselves, how is the system doing? You look at this 
time plot, which is, for example, presenting the albedo measurements, you will see that it's from 2000 to about 2000, December 2011, it's actually a flat trending. So my post to those people who want to change the, set, the, the sea surface temperature record or even that is that you're having a problem here. Okay? Probably that these agree a lot more closer to what the satellite data is doing in terms of the global temperature than what you're doing in your near surface temperature. But then series product, people say, oh, global albedo is just the reflected sunlight part of it, right? And then it turns out, of course, they also have something called the total solar energy, solar energy input available, which is the blue curve down here. This plot is done by my colleague, Sir Willie Sashenbach. Most of you probably know him. He's a very good researcher. And then finally, if you look at it in monthly resolution, you will see that it is a flat trending uh, uh, energy budget in terms of uh, if you... The point is that if this CO2, this warming part is real, this has to have some kind of trend. Actually, decreasing trend if you look at albedo, but on, on the energy, it should be increasing somehow. Maybe the infrared portion of it should be increasing. So, I really think that... And, and by the way, there's another good set of data done by solar physicists which is called the Earthshine Project. It's basically staring at a specific part of the moon to try to get the, the light that is shining from the Earth to get the reflected light so we can measure some control on the albedo. That's a good measurement, by the way. They used to have one station at Big Bear. Now they have a longitude coverage, so it's very good statistics now. And the, the news, on the, they are working on a manuscript that's submitted already under review that they can extend the data up a little bit to 2014. The line is flat. So it will, it will provide a very significant headache to those people who keep insisting on manipulating data in that way, which means it's not self-consistent. The system is clearly flat trending for now, so I'm sorry. So what about the Arctic? The thing that scares everybody to death, supposedly, is that, wow, it's warming, it's warming, and then the usual idea is that it's what you call Arctic amplification. I don't even like all this phrase that is actually created by them. It's somewhat of a pseudoscience in the first place. So don't use their, I don't like their language, so I, I rather speak my own way. If we look at the satellite measurements of the Arctic sea ice extent, as you can see, if you plot it in such a way, in absolute unit, clearly that you see some systematic decreasing trend, but I think when you look at it in that terms, it doesn't look that scary, right? Except the question is to ask, what is causing these changes is the key question. And then also, what is the significance of, for example, looking at the, the fall, the September, which is the lowest, basically, in the Arctic, the sea ice is in the minimum area during September month, and then see how that minimum is changing. Yes, it's decreasing, okay? Uh, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. But the bottom line of all this discussion is always plot like this. I mean, plot like this, as you can see, I hope you already learned enough of, of, at least from my own point of view, what I tell you about climate model. I mean, this is as good as actually asking my three years old or two years old to go paint color and then somehow throw away all the blue and green and all these crayons. I mean, just have the, the green, you know, the red color just paint all over the place. It's all red. That's all you need to know. But the number is really, really scary. It's very, very large. 8 to 12 degrees Celsius by 2100. It's telling you that the computer game is running out of control. Nothing else, okay, in my view. That's the reason, that's a good reason why we should not be so scared, actually, obviously. We just need to understand how it works. To show you how mad I am about the Arctic system, by the way, I started my first paper to show sun climate was based on studying Arctic temperature very carefully. And essentially, I'm pulling some of the old results to show you. And, and uh, the Arctic is essentially a bathtub, really. Right? It's a very sophisticated bathtub. Most of the inflow is coming through the Bering Strait at the top of the graph. And then the outflow is more or less coming in a little bit on the barren side, which is the Norwegian sea side, and then escape through the, uh, the Greenland Sea area. Okay? And uh, this paper is in, of interest to me because of the geology. You know, it's about where all this sediment, all this thing come from. So I wanted to learn a little bit more in details. There is one aspect of the problem that no one talks about until, I would say, essentially a person like this. His name is Duncan Steele. He's, a, he's an astronomer. He's trained in asteroid, and, you know, asteroid sciences, in asteroid, in solar system bodies. 
And what he did is basically to try to ask a very simple question. How is the Sun-Earth orbit has been changing over the last year, specifically 750 years or so? The year 1246 is a very significant time because this is the last time in which your perihelion, which is the shortest distance between the Sun and the Earth, occur at winter solstice, December 21st. Now the winter solstice is about January 4th, right? So it's been, this is due to the precession of the orbits, right? Due to the interactions of all these different bodies, right? The precession of the orbits, essentially the basic idea of Milankovitch, right? Milutin Milankovitch. But what I try to highlight to you here in a bunch of graphs is showing you day from 0 to 365 days or so. And then plotted, the most important line I want you to see is the high latitude 60 north, 80 north line. Okay? What is telling you that over the last 750 years or so, the spring insulation has been increasing and at, at this high latitude region. And the significance of that, I will explain in a minute. Actually, the number, if you look at it, is very large. It's almost 4 or 5 watt per meter square. It's really definitely larger than, than CO2 level, actually. And the spring season is very, very important. It partly explains, actually, what we are seeing. The hypothesis of Professor Duncan Steele is that what we see in the Arctic sea ice, we all know, yes, the Arctic sea ice has been decreasing a little bit in the last uh, 25 years or so, while the Antarctic sea ice has been rising, has been increasing a little bit. And this thing is fully consistent with our hypothesis by saying that the spring insulation in the northern high latitude has been increasing, so therefore melting the ice. Simultaneously, this orbit, because the semi-major axis is not really changing, is actually geometrical effects. The southern hemisphere has been actually decreasing the spring insulation. This already tells you how much the IPCC GECM is missing. If some of you heard what I say in the Paris meeting, I actually throw in the line where I ask all these IPCC key authors whether they have included that effects. Most of the answer is that, well, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, blah, 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 all this. Uh, that just seems too casual. I mean, it's just so strange. And then you ask, can anybody document in each of the 20, 32 models, can you tell me which one include the orbital effects, which one has not? So far, we are not able to get those numbers even. So let me come down to the Arctic temperature that we've been trying to get. This is, again, based on that work that I've done with the two Connollys from Ireland. So this is what the temperature record looked like. In this particular problem, we already admitted that we couldn't do much to handle the problem of... It's not an urban heat island effect per se in this problem here. It's the seating of the thermometer in the Arctic region. They are always somewhat insulated. So I can sh I, at least I know the direction. The warm end is definitely biased, except we don't know how to correct it quantitatively. Now we are seeking all over the world to try to look for any metadata we can find, the station history, so that we can have a, a full control. So that is the next project that Connolly and myself and a bunch of uh, friends from Norway and all those places are doing. And, but I want to throw a very interesting uh, curveball in the baseball speak in America into your picture. I'm plotting now the Arctic temperature versus something what I call the USA temperature. And this USA temperature is actually the maximum temperature of the of USA record, which is a very well-maintained record in that sense. And then what this curve clearly suggests that there is a very close relationship, isn't it, between Arctic and the USA temperature. Completely two different regions. And then I'll show you further details. You can look at Washington, D.C. Hopefully, we can get a little funding to do the work. Washington, D.C. is equally uh, controlled, and then Florida and Tampa Bay. It just so happened that they have very good correlation. And that immediately led to a question. What is going on here? Is it, is it something to do with anything else? I mean, what is doing it? CO2? Maybe, huh? Anyway, I don't think so. I really believe that this is the kind of picture. By the way, I can throw in picture from China and all that. It shows you that you can always start by not talking about the sun at all. You just say, how is it that all this region with so many diverse meteorology and all that that has, appears to have these multi-decadal effects? Then, it, to me, the simplest way to look at this is that perhaps it has something to do with the irradiance. And that's a picture to show you. Again, I admitted to you that near the end of it, the fit was not very good. But the goal is not to fit anything. The goal was just trying to understand what is happening, yes? 
But I, and I, have, I, I, I contend to say that with this graph, we can say that the sun has to do quite a bit in terms of changing how the, the Arctic temperature and especially the temperature equated to pole gradient is changing. We're therefore modulating the, 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 the physics and the cryosphere and the hydrosphere in, in, in the Arctic region. Recently, there is a paper reported about Arctic sea ice reconstruction by this group from St. Petersburg. In fact, I think they are the world leading authority because the Russian happens to have a lot of old records, old data. Well, but you can see the sampling of the data is not as good, but this is the best they can come up with. They come up with the Arctic sea ice uh, uh, concentration. It's kind of more or less normal in 1900 to 1940s, and then it dipped down, probably related to the warmth, and then it go up again. But the key thing I want you to pay attention is, of course, it sort of verified the thing that I was saying. The warm in the 40s and the 30s and the 50s are more or less similar to what we see today, rather than the biased one, yes? The, the current time is extremely warm relative to that. With that graph, I easily could throw in my, my irradiant estimate to show you that there is a, 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 a hint of that, that the, it's the same phenomenon that we are observing. So, it not only extends to, in fact, we have a, a good idea to try to calibrate with satellites, so we'll, we'll go a lot more details in the next layer of work. Then I borrowed this chart from my good friend, uh, Jan Eric Soham from uh, Oslo. He, what is plotting here is basically the observation of the, what you call the summer sea ice edge, right, near the Barents Sea region. Okay? If, it's, if it's warm, of course, it moves further south, and then if it's cold, it, it, if it's cold, it's moved further south. If it's warm, it's moved further north, right? So it's changing at the latitude from about 76 to 82 or so. And then you just put in the solar irradiance estimate by Hoyt and Shorten that I'm, I'm in favor of at least just to study it. Again, the claim is not to say you have found sun climate connection. The claim is to say that to reject this hypothesis will be very, very hard. Okay? Then I want to focus in on the measurements of the, well, over northern hemisphere, roughly covering the, all the Arctic region, yes? You can see the very significant spike of very, very low Arctic uh, sea ice during September or so, especially in 2007 and 2012. But what is happening recently is actually quite interesting to watch, okay? If it has something to do with the sun, then I think there are a lot more to be studied very, very soon. If you look carefully, if you, again, this one, please don't accuse me of cherry picking. I'm just trying to tell you that the tendency of this decrease has a shift. And then of late, of late, if I allow some educated guess, this is done by Dr. Ron Klutz, I think he's from Wisconsin, to estimate the remaining uh, concentration, uh, taking even climatology for December, you can fill in that point for 2015. But what is interesting is that if you look at the annual Sea ice record for the Arctic, it appears to bounce back already. Okay? And I'll explain. I mean, it's of interest to know a little bit more about the future tendency of this sea ice record, rather than keep persisting that it's going to melt all the ice away, right? No matter what you do, by the way, the winter and, and all those high, uh, high concentration sea ice uh, time period will never be, I guess, uh, blown over by this CO2 effects. Then I want to put up a, 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 a quick slide. Please don't read into this. The purpose is to tell you is there is a lot of peer review studies. I can see that the IKs are often accused of not presenting scientific work, quote unquote. Right? Here you have a paper that is published under mainframe science talking about the summer atmospheric Arctic circ atmospheric circulation in a historical perspective. The question here that we want to ask, and the authors is asking. Is this 20, 2007 and 2012 anomalies, is it something so unusual that you just cannot be considered to be anything natural? The short answer is, it is completely natural, actually. If you start classifying in terms of meteorological sense about the circulation pattern. What the author did, I just put a quote first. The quote is that they were able to show through classification of the meteorology, over, let's say, a uh, uh, hundred years or so, that you can have about six, seven major patterns. And I'll point to the major pattern that's relevant to this issue. You can show that the difference between the 2007 and 2012 circulation is nothing extraordinary, okay? It's very, very similar to the pattern in 1923 and 1931. And, and, and that tells you a lot, okay? You can simply rule it out yet. It has nothing to do with CO2, okay? This is the particular pattern. 
And the, the, the statement that the author made is more or less related to the red line which come from the 20th century reanalysis data from the UK office. And the specific pattern is marked up there is more or less related to the high pressure region in the Beaufort Sea and the Greenland area versus the negative po uh, 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 dipole pattern that happens on the other side, which is the Barents Sea region. To try to tell you why is that important is that the Beaufort Gyra, Gyra is actually the biggest reservoir of the fresh water in the Arctic Basin. You can tell, right, from the number, 45,000 cubic kilometers. It's overwhelmed any other region. And it turns out that it's been known for a very long time that the system is completely capable of basically storing the fresh water for extended time. Here, the specific proof they have is for de decadal. I make a postulate that it could work for multi-decadal, that you store this this fresh water, and the fresh water is related to, of course, the thermal property, the cryosphere, and then the influx of the summer Pacific warm water from, from the Bering Sea region. Okay? It's a combination that you store it for a certain amount and then you flush it out through to the Greenland Sea. That's why the meteorology is important. It's that specific pattern that I try to point out too. This is just the, the, the cartoon picture. The key person that done that is Igor Protusinski. I, I, I apologize for mispronouncing his name if I say so. But it's roughly related to this particular uh, weather pattern where you have an anticyclonic upper ocean circulation that allow you to, you know, the, the Bureau of Gyra get expanded, the fresh water is bigger, and then it releases. But this system work on decadal time scale. You definitely have enough oceanographic observation to make such a cartoon. Then the key question that I also want to pose is that I want to jump narrow in into the part where in around 1918 or so actually, that you have this sharp rise and then started to warm up and then what is going on? Is that instrumental or is that real signal? I would propose to say that with all the evidence we have, it's clearly a real signal. Okay? But here's a very interesting quote by the way. You all may have heard that the IPCC have a lot of smart mathematicians and mathematical physicists who claim that they have invented this method called the finger detection uh, 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 methods. It's actually by Professor Klaus Hasselmann and a bunch of his colleagues, including Gabriel Hergels, who is now professor in uh, Scotland, where I hope you see the quote, where it says that that warm in the 1930s and 1940s is so warm that if you apply the same method of uh, finger detection, you would almost claim that it has to do with anthropogenic uh, uh, global warming. Unfortunately, no one would believe that, simply because the carbon dioxide level at that time is so low. This is where it tells you that the methodology is, is almost useless. I mean, I'm sorry, it's a, it's a post hoc invention again, another one of those things that I don't like because it has no relevance. It, it, you know, it's just all very strange kind of thing. You, you cannot keep doing things like this. This is just more documentation. Uh, particular attention I want you to see is around the period of uh, 1911 to 1920 versus 21 to 30, where you got this huge six degree. This is clearly a measured phenomenon that is so warm. And I want to give you the extent of how it's warm, of course. Here we can look at Long Yebin. That will be in uh, South Guard. I may not pronounce it properly, South but uh, you clearly see this phenomenon. You can also see it from ice core record, a, a, a glacier record actually, measuring the oxygen isotope, the stable isotope, where we'll tell you a little bit about the, the temperature changes around that time. It's a very rapid and very large amplitude change of warming that is clearly natural, which means the system is capable of very large shift and changes that has nothing to do with uh, CO2 at all. This is for a very specific region in the high north in the Kola Penance section of the Barents Sea. Again, you clearly see this phenomenon. A little bit more on West Greenland, you see that. Uh, let me speed that. And then I want to come to the biological system. One of the key tests, in my opinion, is, is that on, 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 on trying to assess what this warming means is that, is that you get a lot more Atlantic coat during that period. You can see how it evolved, right? 
From 1900, essentially, the Atlantic caught this very tiny region around the water, and then it started to expand when the temperature warmed up. I hope that people consider that having more caught fish is good for you because you're supposed to be able to supply more people with food, yes? And this extends all the way up to Upper Narvik, which is very high northwest Greenland region. And it shows you that, indeed, you see that these fish are living around the surface and all that. It shows you that this thing really, really is a very huge amplitude change. And it really did occur because the biological system responds to it. Okay? And these are the things that also that and another important fact is basically not only for the small species, the big species like Greenland shark and the white whales is clearly are seeing that they're doing those migrations when it's very, very warm. Okay? They move further north and they stay away from the southwestern western part of Greenland. The part that most people don't quite fully aware is that <clears throat> if you want to talk about this particular sun climate hypothesis, especially from my point of view, <clears throat> you would almost have to ask the question, how does it behave simultaneously in other regions? I have examined very extensively in the Northern Hemisphere, by the way. The real hard part about Southern Hemisphere, now I show you a record of the Southern Hemisphere temperature record, showing you to be careful in the sense that the black curve that I show at the bottom here is actually based on the isotopic temperature, this ice core results, versus the instrumental results. The instrumental result giving you a very different trend where the, where the ice core result actually is telling you something quite interesting, quite similar to what is happening to its northern counterpart. Okay? And I only wanted to tell you that this phenomenon clearly exists. Right? It exists not only in the northern hemisphere, the Arctic region, in the Antarctic, clearly that you have some signature on these on this, uh, measurements. I think I'm almost done now, but uh, I guess I'm not supposed to be in Antarctica, so I better give you this one, or else I'll be accused of being foolish. Thank you.